there's a box in there that's, that's so I'll, I'll put it in a pairing mode.
Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister here with people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation, gender identities, social and economic situations, abilities, and politics. And we advocate for human rights, and we strive to be good stewards of this earth. And as part of our understanding of being part of a deep, radical network of interdependence, we recognize that this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. We take a moment in our Sunday service to recognize them for who they were, for who they are today, for the Peoria people were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. And so we offer our own one small gesture of intentional recognition in this moment. I want to thank everybody for joining us in person and online. We recognize how valuable it is to expand our circles of care, to be together, to offer kindness to one another. So if you are new with us today, please help us get to know you. We have plenty of name tags. We will welcome all the questions. And I invite folks to stay after service. Uh, if you're in person, join us for coffee in Fellowship Hall. Join us for conversation if you're joining us by Zoom or by Facebook as well. Uh, and I invite you to, as part of our mutual care, to turn our, your respective devices to worship mode. If you need a little graphic help, we have some on the screens. I tell you, we have a ministry. Yes. So I want to, I want to offer a moment uh, as we begin for kind of some individual and collective gratitude. On Wednesday night we had discovered a burst pipe. There's a little cutout hole above the back, above the door towards the sanctuary pipes. That is a deceptively small hole for the mess that it made because the pipe behind it broke open spectacularly and sent a water shooting across 20 feet. It soaked the choir uh, the choir rack all the way over there, as well as the piano and the, and the organ console, and left an awful mess in a lot of places. And fortunately, and I can't express how fortunate we were, how lucky we were, that it was found very quickly, within maybe a, I had to be less than an hour. And then folks were able to take steps to turn off the water. We had an ad hoc emergency response team that brought a small fleet of shop facts and, and fans. Folks laid out music to dry, moved furniture, inspected and documented the flooding and much more. And then folks came in the next day to assess everything. I tell you, we now know how to move the organ console and put it back together. Who knew? The upright piano in the back seems fine, but needs a final airing out and a check, which is why you get to learn what a piano looks like on the inside today. I tell you, on Thursday, when the organ was being tested and we heard the first notes from the organ and it sounded okay, there was this collective shout in here of joy and relief. And the pipe was fixed and the water was turned on again. And with the carpet dry and vacuumed, another team gathered yesterday and moved everything back so we could be in the sanctuary once more. And so we could have Fellowship Hall, because that was where all the music was drying out as well. We'll see what the insurance adjuster says, along with the other checks of the electrical panels and so on. I think a lot of the music might be fine. Your leaders will know if there are further needs or concerns. I want to thank everybody for all the ways that people responded, showed up, and helped. Each of us, though every one of us in some part of the network of this, helped in some important way. And I got to say, the collective brain power 
the range of people thinking about things, asked questions and took care of things in a way that was far better than one or two people working alone. So I'm so grateful for the level of activity in this congregation, for people who watch out for the building and for each other, and for the willingness to attend to the care of the whole community. Keeping up with a facility and a congregation of this size demands a lot of time and attention, and sometimes it is exhausting. I mean, this is a lot of building here. Whew. But we were able to respond so quickly and so well and keep the damage to a minimum because of the quality of the facility and its upkeep and the attention of all the people and the generous spirit of the people who showed up. So thank you. I can't thank you enough, and neither can the whole congregation, I imagine, as well. Thank you. So moving forward, we have a couple of other notes. Um, after service today, I want to invite folks to see Jesse Lachlan for our kind of care exercise, which is assembling care kits for um, unhoused uh, Peorians as part of uh, our work with Porch Pantry. Um, at noon, please join me in the conference room. Uh, if you are not able to join us for our vision and visibility planning next Saturday, January 27th, we have, uh, we're trying to kind of help the five-year planning team advise the board on some particular goals. We really need the congregation, again, to show up. And we really, are, really need to hear from people um, and focusing on what this beloved community might accomplish in like the next five years or so on to come. Um, the conversation today is one, if you can't make next Saturday, the conversation today will contribute to that. It'll be a bit abbreviated, understandably, but we want to hear from you. And so if you can at all join us next Saturday, please do so. We'll be doing 9.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. Child care is available. We want to invite folks to RSVP to the office so we can plan, make sure we have enough food, and so on. Um, I, am in, I am facilitating this. I encourage people to be in person if you can. Uh, we have some Zoom available, but I really want to have this be an in-person experience as much as possible. All right. And now... Let us enter into worship with our first hymn, number 118, This Little Light of Mine. Please rise in body or spirit. Mitsi Nietzsche forward for our opening. This is an invocation of liberating love. Buildings speak, not in voices of stone, but 
in the hum of conversation of flesh and bone gathering, nearly mystical at times. Almost we sense mental chains shattering. Almost we hear birds wrenching free of their cages and the walls long hidden in the corners of our mind, walls so defining hold us fast until together our voices rise, trust blooming until there is a sky, blue, unending. Judgments wither like cut flowers then, and love, love is the ground which we on which we dance, singing of liberation. Let me invite Becca Laughlin forward for our chalice. The Names of Love by Rev. Scott Taylor. We light this chalice in the names of love, the love of family that brings us into the beginning, allows us to bloom and sends us on our way with courage, knowing we can return no matter what. The love of partnered hearts that teach us to trust and help, to help us. Know that who we are does not end at the barrier of our own skin. The love of friends who help us feel seen and sing our song back to us when we cannot hear it with our ears alone. The love of community that helps, that bathes us in belonging and calls us to see the needs of others as our own. And the greatest love, the love that will not let us go, even in our fear, even in our failure, even when we are lonely or lost, love invites us home if we listen. It, it is doing so even today.
want to invite us now into a time of reflection, to a time of pondering and pausing and listening. We enter into this time together, knowing that though we are separate in our contemplation, we are gathered in this circle. We'll have our music for meditation and continue the reflection. All are welcome to come forward, light candles with us as an intentional act of what is in your mind and on your heart. If you're joining us online, let these lights be for you as well. Let us enter into this time in our music for meditation.
from our separate joys and struggles. We come here to find a place of balance, to find the blessing of restlessness. All are welcome to follow, to lead, to teach, to learn. All are welcome to join in the dance, to catch our breath. All are welcome to give generously, to receive gratefully. All are welcome. If we are steady and composed, if we feel completely lost, if we don't know what we are feeling, the community has a place for us here. We matter and we are loved. This is the time for the sharing of the joys and sorrows of the congregation. And we have one particular note of care for Mary Mahalan Kafar and her wife, Marsha. Mary shared with me that Marsha has decided to enter into hospice care, that this is the last chapter of her life. Mary has been able to visit with her, is going to be staying with her. So let us offer our care and our support for Mary, for Marcia, as she is in this journey, and for all who care for them. And I want to offer a note for our larger world. There are many concerns in our larger world that are ongoing. And some we don't necessarily say them every time, every week or so, but there is so much. And I think in this moment I offer, want to offer our moment for the ongoing war against Hamas and its brutal impact on the Palestinian people. Perhaps there are some moments when there's no further words, but let us hold that in our hearts as well. Let us take one more moment in quiet together for all the names, the milestones, the joys, and the sorrows among us. For all that is within us, it is unspoken. I invite you to breathe with me and pause. Shalom, salam, and namaste. I invite Jesse forward for a story. Before today's story, I'd like to mention that next week, I won't be up here telling the story. We will have the honor of hosting Brian Fox Ellis, storyteller for the sermon, and he'll be doing the honors for the Time for All Ages as well. And the children are welcome to stay for the whole service next week. Brian Fox Ellis is a treat. Have you ever wanted to say yes to something, but maybe you hear some no's in the background. Maybe some people say, that's not possible. Well, I have a story about saying yes today. (laughs) 
The Yes by Sarah B. and Satoshi Kitamura. In a soft, comfy nest, in a warm, safe place, snoozed a great, big, orange thing called the Yes. He was snug, but the Yes had a where to go. So he left his nest and went trundling out to sea. The where was an endless place of no's. The no's were everywhere and every what, in swarms and flocks and packs. They teemed, they seethed, they picked and nipped and snipped and snickered. The yes came to a tree. Was the tree too tall to climb? The no's swarmed around the yes in a thick cloud of no and said all the no's there ever were. No too big, no too tall, no too silly, no, you'll fall. But the no's were small and the yes was large. The no's were flimsy and the yes was bulky. The no's were not a thing, and the yes was a great, big thing. The yes looked and climbed the tree. Yes. And so the yes bumbled on. In a further part of the big wide where, he came to a river. Yes? No, 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 it's much too deep. No, 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 it's much too steep. No, beware. No, don't dare. No. The nose put up a wall of no that went all around the where and into all the this until everything was full of no. The yes looked. Yes. The yes grumbled on. And after a when, he came to a scary dark wood in the where. No, 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 no. Yes. The yes rumbled on over rocks and bumps and dips. The no's knowed, and knowed in numbers no one could count. And the yes, only yes, in all his goodness and bigness and yesness. And then the yes came to a big rolling hill, and the no's did the loudest, knowingest no they could do. But all the no's. In all the where, all put together, were only a no in the end, a no made of dust, and nothing that wasn't ever really there at all. And so the yes went up and up and up, until the noise of the nose in their knownness and notness grew smaller and smaller and fainter and fainter until there was no more no. There was only the yes. Yes. I wonder what you'll say yes to. The children are invited to join me for religious education.
want to take note that the offering we receive each Sunday is not a mere habit, is not just a, a daily, oh, I like daily. Yeah, let's go do the, let's do the offering daily, shall we? I'll go with that. Oh, oh, weekly. Okay, we'll go that weekly too. However often, in any day that ends with why, for example, it is an opportunity to recommit to this place and to this people. Our offering is an affirmation. It is a yes. And we give, and when we give, and when we do so, we say this is something we value. And our gifts freely given says we say yes to the values of this community, of this congregation, of what we are about. We breathe life into this place through all the ways that we gather and all the ways that we contribute. Speaking of, we need some help cleaning up from coffee hour today. There we go. There's other ways to contribute. Thank you. Bernie might need, asked me to make sure to remember that. We, the members and friends, offer the comfort and the experience and the resources and the funds that take care of this congregation. So please join me in expressing gratitude through a financial gift and doing so during worship that we may recognize that as an intangible, intentional act of giving. And in this congregation, we also share a portion of our financial abundance with our share the plate practice. We give one third of our undesignated offering to a group in the community doing good work with our neighbors. And this month we are supporting Lula NFP. Uh, Lula works with area groups um, to support, to offer essential uh, resources to our unhoused neighbors, including working with Porch Pantry, for whom we are making the, the care bags today after service. And I'll say one of, the, one of the components of those care bags usually are hand warmers. So you can imagine in a time like this how important that is. So our share of the plate is two-thirds of the undesignated collection goes to the church, one-third goes to the named agency, Lula in this case. Please use the envelopes for the offering and indicate its use or see the QR code in the order of service. And we'll thank, thank you for all the ways that you give in this moment. And now I want to invite the ushers to please come forward. Our reading today is a reflection offered by my colleague, the Reverend Sam Trumbor. I invite you now into a time of gratitude, reflection, renewal, and hope.
What an unearned blessing to delight in the calming peace of this space. To know the bright, the bright whiteness and shine of snow this day. To feel the warmth in the room. Each moment of wakefulness has so many gifts that offer energy and delight. And yet, too often they seem unavailable as the weight of our troubles press down on us. The threats to our well-being, real or exaggerated, feel like mosquitoes in the night looking for places to land. Minds become captive to rising floodwaters forceful, murky, threatening, ominous. Even in moments of great danger, the direction of attention is a choice. Fear can dominate the mind, binding like a straitjacket. Our love can unbind and open to resource and opportunity. The soil of the mind can be watered with kindness. The thorns can be removed one by one to appreciate the buds ready to flower. Great possibilities await us even if all we can see is the cliff before us. The grandeur of life of which we are a part scatters rainbows in every direction as the deluge approaches. Holding reality and possibility together is the holy, hope-filled work of humanity if we choose it again and again in love. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. Please be seated. So many of you know of my background in theater. I was active in theater all through high school. My undergraduate degree is from the University of Massachusetts, also in theater. And I pursued that knowing, even knowing full well, I wasn't actually going to work in theater, but still. But being part of the program and doing technical work as a stage manager, because I was the stage manager, not the actor on stage, equipped me for the multitude of tasks and skills 
I got to say, needed for ministry, including having to be entirely online and recording worship for our first year together here. I am a far better minister because of theater. And that started, that path started when I said yes in the face of a no. So here we go. So freshman year high school, I became friends with some of my friends, uh, friends of friends through church. I gotta say, my, so I had a small town. My eighth grade class was a whole graduating class of 52. It's a small town. And I entered a regional high school of about 1,600 students. And so church connections helped immensely. The annual musical, they always did a play, they always did a musical. The annual musical that year was Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert and Sullivan. And this is a great musical for high school because it needs lots of Major General's daughters and lots of pirates, as well as the leads. And, you know, I went along with these friends, most of whom were about a year older than me, and we all tried out together. And then it came to the list of who made it. All of my friends were in. I was not. I didn't make the cut. I mean, I just didn't. I was a freshman, so they were kind of erring on the side of the older students. I can understand that. And I actually also really hadn't found a voice in that moment. But then came the first day of rehearsal, and my friends thought that I should just come with them. But they had this confidence that I should be there. I did not. I did not. I declined. I hesitated. I mean, showing up when I was told no was really not my style, especially by adults, right? But they persisted, kindly, gently, enthusiastically, and I agreed. So we all showed up together. But then the director looked at me and inquired, I said I was there, I just wanted to help. And so, he declared that I was the assistant stage manager. Oh gosh, I, I, I was not good at it. But I joined the whole cast through the entire process. I learned the whole show as they did. And later in the process, these friends noted, gosh, you know, there isn't actually a stage manager Maybe I should be given that title. And I was. Oh gosh, I didn't qualify, but I got the title. And that show was just the beginning of being the stage manager for every show in high school until I graduated. All the plays, all the musicals, and then college. It's also that particular show is an inherent part of my internal and sometimes external soundtrack. I am the very model of a modern major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England, and I quote the fights historical, from Marathon to Waterloo, nor to categorical. I am very well acquainted to as Mathers mathematical. I understand equations both the simple and quadratical. About binomial theorem, I'm teeming with a lot of news, with many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Yo. I may not have had much of a voice at those tryouts, but I did find a yes. Yes. What a deceptively simple and short word. Yes. Perpetually challenging, too. A conundrum, a puzzle, a mystery, a place to undiscovered things. Yes. We hear so many no's in our lives, including at ourselves, those that are self-inflicted. I can't, I won't, I shouldn't. Self-inflicted they are, self-limiting frequently. But also from people in so many ways, I'm sure every one of us has stories of people who have said no to us who should love us, who should guide us, who should respect us, and yet still say no. Yes. 
We have such a world of no. You are not good enough. You are not tall enough. You are not skilled enough. You are not young enough. You are not old enough. You are not white enough, and so on. A terrible, world-shaking no of no's. So when I talk about yes, I mean possibility, connection, the potential to shift the world, that we can love our neighbor, that we can love our earth. It is the freeing power of yes even when, and especially when, we have no idea what will happen. And yet we say yes. And I want to discern, I want to define, there's a difference between uh, yes all the time, like all the yes. And that's different than offering a healthy boundary in our lives, where we get to define personal space, emotional needs, mental health. You know, I'm part of the the dirty dancing school of self-deferentiation. This is my dance space. That is your dance space. I'm a firm believer that no is a complete sentence. And there's certainly no's that we should be saying against injustice. If we continue Dr. King's work, for example, beyond, you know, celebrating one particular day of him, recognizing how many ways that he articulated the yes and the no around racial justice, around economic justice, and much more. In our work with pride and being welcoming, we are saying no to bias, to dehumanizing people because of their gender and sexual orientation, and we are saying yes to love, and to being our full selves. So there is so much to work with in yes. I appreciate Kwame Alexander's TED Talk from 2017, The Power of Yes. He says, when we say yes, we are allowing our minds to create a reality for us rather than letting others created for us. We are allowing our minds to create a reality for us rather than letting others create it for us. So this yes is an invitation to imagination, to one that is based in love, that depends on each of us participating and is also larger than us, is also the great power that comes from being this collective yes. And certainly, we know there's always no's. There's always no's. Alexander says, Here's what I know. The no's are part of life. I think we got to learn to embrace the no's. They get they're going to happen. It's the way the universe works. But here's the cool thing. Once all the no's come to the party and they go home, they're exhausted. I love that image. All the no's show up and then they, they they spin their wheels and then they're tired. Oh, they're done. What's left is the yes. And we just need one yes, one great rumbling yes to go forward. And there are yeses all around us. There are people where we don't have to, as a faith, as a tradition, as a church, we're not actually alone in saying yes either. I'm learning about there are these increasing number of more independent congregations 
that are becoming more inclusive. They're moving away. They may have started from a fundamentalist, conservative, evangelical Christian place, but they're moving away from that in the values and theology from the religious news service in December. Uh, Vinings Lake, I think in uh, Georgia, is one of a handful of spiritual communities across the U.S. sprouting from the soil of the ex-evangelical and deconstructive deconstruction movements. And while their Sunday morning gatherings retain the basic structure of many Christian services, they have music and teachings and fellowship, these collectives reject dogma, prefer questions over answers, and have no intention of converting anybody to anything. And here, they say, LGBTQ plus inclusion is not up for debate. People of all and no faiths are welcome, and Jesus can be a savior, a radical rabbi, or a metaphor, depending on your spiritual inclination. And what I appreciate about these folks, it reminds me of what we're also needing to do in this moment, defining themselves as much by who they are than by who they are not. They are defining themselves as positive. They're naming who they are, what's important, as opposed to simply dwelling in the reaction, dwelling in the no. So we are not alone as a faith in wanting spiritual growth, wanting to welcome, and needing to practice. No one tradition should have the monopoly or think they are unique. And yes, there are so many people who are searching and need beloved community. So part of our yes, individually and as, as a congregation, is to recognize how much we support and care and mutually respect one another as faiths as well. They have these values and drives toward inclusion, towards liberation, towards love that keep popping up in our human history. You know, again, the yes has been happening for a long time, even when severely squashed. The yeses to freedom and reason and tolerance and love keep persisting. So part of how we can say yes is to recognize that we have company and we have partners in the work. My colleague, the Reverend Peter Friedrich, says, I do think that there is a link between saying yes and our liberal religious values I've said before, we are progressive, yes, people. We are people of possibility. We are called to look for and work for good, for opportunity, for a world we can imagine, a world that is not yet, but will and can be. Our commitment to justice and equity and compassion, to inherent worth and dignity are all the ways we say yes, certainly to ourselves and certainly to each other, and to our neighbors, and to our communities, and to the world, we must show up in this yes. And because we believe in the power of life, and truth, and love, and we are called to say yes every day, every day. Even when, he says, faced with the repercussions of mobs storming the Capitol, or threatening our democracy, or a very way of life. I still figure, if my colleagues in Texas can be free and open with using the phrase unapologetically progressive, then we should too. Because we need that imagination that helps us say, yes, we have this human call into being, into a creative life. Even when everything is a mess. There's a feature on NPR yesterday in the show Through Line with a piece called When Things Fall Apart. And it reminds me of how the stakes matter and how the system is hard. 
in the episode, they, the producers, the creators, remind us with the depth of skepticism about human generosity, about the depth of our self-interest, our selfishness, and all the ways that we ignore or dismiss our fellow human beings, all the ways that we dehumanize one another. And we have these spectacular moments in our history, in our society, when the systems that have been so poorly done to actually be generous to people fail, such as when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005, and those systems failed completely, entirely. And it was because of and on top of a deep legacy of racism. This terrible disaster was a fine example of spectacularly powerful no's. You had areas of the time where you had these white vigilantes with guns trying to say they were protecting people from being looted and ended up shooting all the, all the black people who were shot were shot by white men. Not good and very dangerous. But still people found each other, recognized their humanity and helped and kept helping. It came from a legacy of care in this case, found in generations of black communities. In that immediate moment, it came from the Black Panther organizations that had served the people for a long time. Folks from that moment took note of the context and applied compassion and real effort to their neighbors. All of their neighbors created a network like the porch pantry where that got started from of simply saying i see my people are i see my people are suffering and how can i be a center of help you had this legacy of mutuality being the foundation for people then saying we can do this now and here to be inspired to be motivated to find new forms to recognize how we have so much more in common than we have different and these people form the common ground collective, defied the naysayers and the white vigilantes, and came together. And that group still works, still serves the neighbors, and is now restoring the health and stability of the environment of the coast. One of the show's creators in this through line episode, Ramtin Arabule, talked. Today it's really easy to believe that we live on a thin veneer of society. We're constantly being bombarded by bad news, by an onslaught of apocalyptic foreshadowing. It's become trendy to joke about the end of the world. You go dumpster fires, woohoo. And this of course isn't completely unfounded. Climate change is an existential threat. There's misinformation, runaway capitalism, but really, but really, who does it serve when we're all swimming in this toxic soup of pessimism and hopelessness and despair? Who does it serve? Rutger Bregman, a Dutch historian and author of the book Humankind, A Hopeful History, says in this episode, I've always believed in the power of utopian thinking. Every milestone of civilization at the end of slavery, democracy, equal rights for humans, they were all utopian fantasies until they happened. This is why I think, he says, that history is the most subversive discipline of all the social scientists. I love this. It's the most subversive discipline because history shows that things can be different. They don't have to be this way. We can change them. We can believe in the power of hope. And if you believe in hope, you're actually hopeful for the future, then you know you've got to do something. So let us go forth from this moment, from the context of so many no's, 
And remember that enduring spirit of yes that has been with us all the way. However long we've been part of this community, this congregation, there is this collective yes. What inspires you, what you dream, what moves you to love and serve, all adds up to something much larger than any one of us can create alone. So let's, let's accept this invitation to yes and discover where we might go. I hope you'll join us for the conversation after service today about the vision and vitality of this congregation or next Saturday as well. It is such a gift to be able to say yes with you as well. Let us go forth. Amen. Please rise in body and spirit. Join me for our closing hymn, Come and Go With Me, number 1018 in the Teal Hymnal. this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We all emerge from, dwell within, are transformed by and called back to love. May your mind be humbled before this mystery. May your heart grow hopeful by it. And may you be sustained by this love always. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>